Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. And um, uh, as you noted, Councillor Adams is absent. Um, really pleased to extend our congratulations to she and her husband on the birth of their new baby boy, Oscar. So she wanted that to be passed along, who was born early this morning. Um, so we have a brand new constituent in town uh, to be mindful of, but uh, excited for her and her new family and um, not exactly sure what her plans will be, um, you know, for meetings going forward. And since we're doing these Zoom things, I think maybe she plans to participate a little bit more than she might have otherwise, but we'll see what happens. So at least for tonight, you're stuck with me. So um, before we get going, Deb, can you present our colors and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, to the flag United of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which, for which stands, stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. Thank you very much. Does any counselor have anything to report or any correspondence to share? Um, I'd like to make a report. Sure, go ahead, Councilor Devereaux. I um, attended the um, Zimprich Symposium this year. They have it every year at Thomas Memorial Library. And this year it was um, on Zoom. It was really wonderful. It was wonderful that um, the library and Dr. Melanson were, were able to put it together with all the kids from the school and parents and different people so that everybody could participate. It was wonderful. And uh, I just want to remind everybody to uh, join in next year. They do it every year, usually the end of April or first of May. So um, it was wonderful. Great, thank you very much. Anybody else with anything to report? Okay, uh, I'll recognize myself for the finance committee report. <coughs> Um, so, uh, the finance committee met, uh, in workshop jointly with the school board, um, two weeks ago now, uh, on the 20, 28th and 29th, um, to have a presentation of the fiscal 21 school budget and discussion, just general discussion about, um, continued general discussion about the town municipal budget and the school budget. Uh, we have later on on our agenda um, an item to vote on and, and formalize the rest of the, the budget schedule. Uh, and I know that there'll probably be some other discussion around that. Um, but uh, uh, the meetings for both the workshops were well attended um, by the public. And um, we continue to get uh, input from folks on the fiscal 21 budgets. Um, and uh, so we'll keep keep plugging away on that. Um, everybody has their dashboard uh, that was sent out. Um, Matt, I'm going to ask you if there's uh, anything specifically you want to highlight, um, particularly from what you're seeing in the last few weeks. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be ha happy to. Uh, there's a couple different things that you'll notice in the dashboard. Uh, Specifically excise tax, we're a little bit, we've now dropped a little bit below where we were going to be, uh, or where we were at this point last year, but not as much as I anticipated. And uh, so I'm, I was fairly pleased to actually see us, uh, we're roughly 70,000 less than we were at this point last year. Uh, in my manager's report, I'll talk about one of the methods that we're looking to do to uh, make it uh, uh, the ability for residents who would like to register their cars uh, more available for them. So we're looking to help uh, with that because a lot of folks are buying new cars as well as buy, uh, purchasing uh, cars privately. So we're, we're putting in some mechanisms in place to allow people to do that. Um, so we, I think we may capture some of the area of revenue that we uh, may not have hit in the last month, but there is a lot of pent up demand. Uh, looking at revenue sharing, we are greater at this point than we were at last year related, relative to our uh, anticipated we're just under 88 percent uh with two months left to go in the uh in the year so i anticipate us hitting that which was a, which has been a concern 
uh, looking at state numbers, but uh, where we were at and what we anticipated, I think we're going to hit hit uh, our target. Uh, building permit fees are well in advance of where we were at this point last year. There and continues to be extremely strong as a sector in the economy, at least at least here in Cape Elizabeth. I know Ben is extremely busy uh, with permits right now. Uh, he's getting a lot of them coming in. People are maybe one of the side effects of people being home is that they're seeing projects that they'd like to get done and are taking advantage of the time as well as potentially uh, lower interest rates uh, if they are having that done. Uh, but there is a lot of that activity taking place and we are at 119% to actual for this year in the last month. Hasn't shown any slowing down. Uh, and then on the, on the expense side, our, we're tracking pretty much along there. Although our overtime numbers are down a lot uh, in both police and public works. Uh, at this point last year, uh, sorry, uh, public works is down to, to where we were thinking, but uh, tracking comparable to where we should be. But police is at 55%. Uh, to where we anticipated at this point last year, they're at 83 and a half percent. So we've seen uh, quite a bit of savings on that, as well as, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty much done in the salt business for this year, notwithstanding this past Saturday. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, uh, once we turn the calendar to May, uh, it's usually a safe bet that our salt budget won't take in any more uh, abuse, but it was doing well before then. Uh, and then our legal services budget line has been doing extremely well in comparison to where we were. Uh, and that's put mostly due to us uh, coming in the home stretch with our Paper Streets uh, lawsuit. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too much, but felt it was important to explore that uh, this evening. Does anybody have any questions for Matt specific on the dashboard? Penny? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Matt, I know you talked about excise tax, but here isn't, uh, don't we have until uh, mid-July to register vehicles? People do, and uh, some may want to take, take advantage of that situation, but uh, others who are running without plates, uh, people generally want to have plates on their car when they're driving. Uh, if they plan on going someplace else other than uh, maybe out of state or something along those lines. Uh, for that matter, they may need to travel further. Who's going to uh, go out of state, you silly? Oh, sorry. Have you seen any out of state plates in Cape Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> no, my point is, is I think some of it's going to flip over into next year. I think we will. I think we'll see. We'll also see that some of that revenue as well. And our auditors have, uh, or have provided guidance to say, and, and John and I have talked about this, to, to book that as revenue in the current year, if it comes in in July and August, uh, but they were supposed to be booked in June or May, for instance. Okay, um, okay. So we, but we'll, we'll address that as we go along. But I think we'll, uh, you know, the important thing for us now is to be able to provide that service to folks uh, when they do want to register for new cars, especially the private sales. Those are really tough because people don't have, you know, they're kind of orphaned out there, to be frank, uh, without any ability where you'd have all the paperwork you would have from a dealership to show if you get stopped by a policeman, uh, this case it'll be, we're looking to do it that way. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you for the question. Any other questions on the dashboard specifically? Um, uh, I was curious, oh, sorry, Jamie. Um, I was just curious about the sewer, if you had any insight on the sewer fees, is that a timing issue or is there, are we seeing a, a fall off there? I think it's a timing issue, uh, and and I anticipate us to get close to actuals by the end of the year. We've we've tracked that number all along, and I think it's a you know we have more users coming on board, so uh, I think we're gonna. I think it's a question of timing, but we should we should when it's all said and done, I think we should hit actuals. Matt, I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, and if you need to come back on it, that's fine. But do you have any sense of um, any expense savings to the town as a whole from um, less utilities being utilized to operate buildings that have been closed, the library, um, the schools, some of the other buildings, uh, less fuel costs. Um, I know that, you know, I see the public works and police and fire out quite a bit, but obviously our school buses have been parked and some of the other support vehicles for community services and things like that. Is there any any 
quantifiable savings that we're recognizing? In comparison to large picture, some, but not not larger. The operational side of it, you know, the electricity and heating bills in some of the uh, in some of the buildings that have been lightly used in comparison to normal, uh, we should find a savings there. I would think on the school side, they definitely would find a fuel savings because it just the bus buses just haven't been operating. Uh, they'll know that when they get to the end of their uh, when they get to the end of their uh, year. I'm sure of that. Um, our big savings is going to be, uh, quite honestly, I think. Uh, is I'm, I'm thinking on overtime in a couple different areas is where we're gonna find a big savings. Uh, and that's mostly labor costs is where, we do, uh, is where we'll find, uh, where we'll find the majority of our savings. And then other, other items that uh, you know, we didn't purchase because we haven't had the need as much for supplies and other lines like that where we won't have, have to have the purchases that we would normally do in our normal course of operation. The big thing that got me thinking about this was I opened up my own water bill, which was significantly higher <laughs> because <laughs> we've got what, you know, we're running more water with everybody being home, dishwashers running almost twice a day, sometimes uh, things like that. And then there's, you know, more people using the bathrooms at home <laughs> during the day that otherwise would be at school or an office. So I was thinking conversely, uh, when you take all that out of the municipal and, and school facilities, that that might be particularly on the water side might be a significant savings, but. And we, and we will, towards the end, when we get towards the end of the full year, I'll be able to report better on that. Yeah. We can quantify it at that point in time. Okay. Are there any, uh, Chris, I see your hand, go ahead. I, I was just gonna note on the sewer, I also had at first glance said, oh, why are we running so far behind last year? But it looked like that started to kick in in uh, December, January, and we've been losing ground since then. Um, so I just assumed it was uh, that for whatever reason, big chunks came in last year during December and January. Um, but uh, it started up prior to COVID and everything else, it seemed. Okay. Any other questions on for the finance report? All right. Like I said, we'll address the budget schedule and clearly lay all that out coming up um, uh, as part of our agenda. So um, next we'll go to uh, pull up my agenda again. Um, citizen opportunity for items that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, is there anybody from the public of which we currently have uh, about a dozen or so folks? Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on something not on tonight's agenda? Um, Matt, I see David Backer's hand raised, so if you could cue him up. Uh, if you could give us your name and address and limit your comments to approximately three minutes, we'd appreciate it. And David, your mic is open, go ahead. Yep. Hello? Music is not coming from me. <laughs> That's me. Go ahead, David. Uh, my name is David Backer. Um, my address is 25 Drew Road in South Portland. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that it's not Cape Elizabeth, although I am in the very first South Portland Road across the Cape Line. After having been a Cape resident for many years. But I am um, appearing tonight in my capacity as president of the board of directors of the TD Beach to Beacon 10K. And um, as you all know, uh, the board of directors made a decision to cancel the 2020 race that was scheduled for um, August 1. Um, the governor's um, order for the schedule of reopening the state um, sort of forced our hand, but we were ready to make that decision even before the governor um, issued. Um, her reopening order. And I just wanted to um, appear to thank um, the town, um, the town council, um, the Fort Williams Park Committee and its chair, Jim Kearney, um, the town liaison to the Fort Williams Park Committee, Kathy Raftis, uh, for all of the support that you have given the TD Beach to Beacon over the 22 years that we have successfully run the race. 
And um, we, it's only due to that wonderful partnership that the race has had with the town that has enabled us to do this for 22 years and uh, develop what has become a race of national and international stature. So we will be back in 2021 with your support, uh, stronger and better than ever. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you all for all the support you've given us throughout this process. Thanks very much, David. And, um, you know, certainly uh, it's, it, well, it wasn't necessarily a surprise. Um, you know, I've, I've been a runner. I know several of the other counselors are, uh, Matt, as well. And it uh, certainly was disappointing, but, you know, absolutely understand the decision that had to be made and uh, wish you and all the organizers all the best. Um, and I'm sure, like you said, uh, 2021 will be the best one yet. Um, as people come back together from this. So thanks very much for your comments tonight. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Good luck to you all. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public wishing to speak on something not on tonight's agenda? If so, uh, raise your hand using the raise hand feature. And if not, we will move on to the manager's monthly report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to just uh, start off. I know a lot of folks know, or, or may or may not know, that the Memorial Day celebration and parade is not going to be held this year uh, due to the uh, challenges of the uh, numbers and the pandemic and all the fun that that has brought. Uh, however, I am very pleased to let you know that the town has been working in the background uh, to pull together a virtual event that we will have uh, on our website as well as on the TV station on Memorial Day. Uh, we've had some, a lot of staff that have been dedicated to this, uh, putting together uh, really just a fantastic production to, to commemorate and honor our, our veterans and those who serve, uh, currently serve and have served for the country. So uh, look for that if you, if you get the chance on Memorial Day. It's not the same as being live, but it's, uh, it's its first cousin. It's gonna be a beautiful event and uh, we've got some great staff who've done a beautiful job on it. And we've tried to provide all the elements that you normally see, uh, but this time you'll have to see it on a much smaller scale. But uh, I think we've, I think hopefully people will be pleased by that. Um, getting into my report, uh, as we continue to move forward through the challenge of the pandemic, we're slowly seeing signs of adaptation that will allow us to begin the process of reopening our operations. To that end, I'm in the process of working with our different department heads to establish operating procedures to assist the public, open our facilities, and provide the services in an expanded fashion. Once this plan is finalized, I will be updating the council on our plans. We will also be developing our plans in accordance with the governor's multi-phase plan for reopening of services. With that being said, I can update the council on what we do know for timing at this point. We anticipate opening the Thomas Memorial Library to drive through services effective June 1st. The library director has established a multi-stage reopening plan that will develop into a full opening of services over time. Our tax collector and clerk area is projected to open June 1st, but we will be limiting the volume allowed in the common area for transactions, scheduling appointments, and providing the other services provided by this section of town operations. We'll require customers to wear masks for transactions, and we're installing protective glass in the transaction areas. This is all in accordance with the governor's orders. The collector's office can now, as I was talking about earlier, uh, provide auto registration services for all transactions, effective immediately. Residents looking to register their autos, autos may call the office, and the tax collector's office will either mail or email the required forms to them advise the amount of fees that are needed to be paid and make arrangements for completing the transactions, including uh, providing them with the license plates that they need. The pool and fitness facilities are planned to be open on July 1st in accordance with phase three of the governor's plan. We thought we were going to be able to start the pool earlier, but they are, we, provide, we have received specific guidance from the governor's office that that would be under phase three. And so we're looking at July 1st for that. However, there will be a number of new improvements at the pool. Uh, we have taken advantage of this downtime to do much needed maintenance to the pool and we will not have the scheduled closure in August that we have had annually for years. However, uh, 
the community services summer camp program is set to begin June 22nd. Staff is working on setting up a safe environment for campers and staff with additional tents, social distancing measures, masks and sanitizers to address safety needs. There's a huge network of providers across the state and they've all been coordinating the best practices for that with, for what is a much needed service for the residents of town. And finally, I wanna take a moment to thank all of our essential employees who have been working all along and performing heroically for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Our police department, public works, recycling, fire, EMS, and our dedicated town hall staff have been taking care of people, handling our infrastructure and taking care of the town's business needs. Additionally, the Thomas Memorial Library has moved so much of their programming online in such a creative manner and with large turnouts. All of their efforts day in and day out are greatly appreciated, as well as that of Wendy Derswick, our webmaster, who seems to put items up on the website uh, moments after they've been uttered. Uh, much of this work is unseen, but I think it's important to take a moment to say thank you for all the hard work. That's my manager's report for this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much, Matt. Are there any questions for the town manager? Seeing none. Um, next up on the agenda is review of the draft minutes and it's a full plate here um, of our regular meeting that was held April 13th and three special meetings that were held April 1st, 8th and 28th. Is there a motion regarding the draft minutes for these meetings? I, this is Penny. I'd, Councilor Jordan? Yeah, I would move that we uh, approve all of the minutes uh, from the meetings rather than take them individually, take them all in a chunk and approve them all. There's a motion to approve all four minutes as presented. Sounds like Councilor Caitlin Jordan is chiming in with a second. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, Deb, could you give us a roll call vote on this? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item is uh, a block agenda of items 67-2020 through 70-2020. Um, the items are uh, as follows, uh, in by the seas liquor and special amusement permit, a bond refunding item. Uh, scrolling past all that. Um, the acceptance of a public safety grant and acceptance of a charitable bequest. Um, is there anybody that wishes to pull out any of these items from the block uh, consent agenda? Councillor Penny Jordan. I just, um, I, I would like to pull out the one around the bond because it just doesn't seem to fit with the others. Plus I have a couple of questions regarding that. Very well. So we'll remove number 68 and handle that individually. Are there any others from this um, consent agenda that anybody wishes to see pulled out and dealt with individually? Okay. Um, counselors Jordan and Jordan, I can't remember if the Inn by the Sea is one of your business partners or not. Um, actually, In by the Sea does a lot of support for the um, Cape Farm Alliance and Cape Farmers, so um, I don't feel that's going to influence my decision in any way, but I would like to state that. I didn't think it would, but thought I'd offer you that chance. And Caitlin? Same. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so uh, let's do the remaining uh, consent agenda items. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on items 67, 69, or 
uh, 70. Let me go back to that. I don't see any hands raised from the public. So I will assume no comments on those. So uh, I will entertain a motion to approve. I'll entertain a motion on items 68, 70, uh, yeah, 68, 67, 68, and 70. Mr. Chairman, if I may, it's, I think it's 67, 69, and 70. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I lost my note. 67, 69, and 70. Thank you for the correction. So moved. Move to, uh, to approve uh, I, I those? I move to approve. As presented? Yep. As presented. Okay. Uh, so there's a motion to approve as presented in the agenda for 67, 69, and 70. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, Deb, would you please do a roll call? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. And Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. So we'll go then to item number 68-2020, refunding of a, a 2008 bond issue. Um, this is upon the recommendation of the finance director, John Corderaro, that we issue refunding bonds for the 2008 general obligation bond issue. The bonds are dated May 15th, 2008 for $2.25 million, maturing on April 15th, 2028. The principal balance is a million dollars and the schedule interest payments are $181,688. Both the town and the school are responsible for the debt service as both departments had projects financed under the bonds and the savings will be realized proportionally. The current estimate for the net savings is of $70,000 over the eight year life of the bonds. Uh, the bond council and the financial advisors have both um, weighed in on this and prepared the order. I will turn to see if there's anybody from the public first that wishes to uh, speak on this item. Please raise your hand in the meeting function. Seeing none, uh, either John, who I see is, um, uh, John was, is John still with us? Yeah, yes, John's still with us in the meeting. And Matt, either of you wanna weigh in anything uh, by way of an introduction before we go to council of questions? Uh, I'll let, uh, John's done a lot of great hard work on this. And uh, since I just promoted him up to a uh, panelist, uh, I'll let him explain uh, the, the mechanism behind this, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead, John. John Cordero, Finance Director. Uh, the, uh, the item before you is to issue a current refunding bond, a uh, million dollars. Our estimate at the moment is a gross savings of about $110,000. There's about $40,000 estimated in cost of issuance, including the cost of uh, credit rating, the cost of uh, uh, issuing the bonds, the finance uh, advisor and bond council. So that's why we get to a, an estimated net savings of $70,000 over the remaining eight years. This does not extend the period of time of obligation from the original 2008 bond issue. It just helps us to reduce the cost by reducing the interest rate given the current environment. Okay. Was that the area of concern, uh, Councilor Jordan? Yeah. Go ahead, Penny. That's what I, yeah, that's what I wanted to understand is what, why we were doing it at this point in time, what was the benefit to the town? And, um, and I assumed it had to do with some interest rates at this point in time, but I just needed to be clear about that. that that's quite okay. That's what the, uh, what the item is. Are there any other questions uh, for John or uh, Matt on this? I have a logistical question um, and that is uh, on the authorization of this, I assume this requires 
all of us to sign um, the measure if it's passed, right, Matt and Deb? I, I don't think uh, it's for council signature, right, John? No, uh, the council, your vote is your authorization. Okay. Yeah, I think I didn't know if this was something we had to be signatory to. Yeah, on the last on the last two that we've done, I know I have. Uh, once the council's authorized, I, I've been the signer on that. Uh, so yeah, I think we. I was just trying to remember through what we've done the past couple of years, but but I think we'll be fine on that as long as the council authorizes it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it looks like the authorizing language allow sets Matt or or the chairman up to be the signing agent. Great. Very well. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, I move to um, issue the refunding bond uh, as proposed in the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Gabrielson. Is there a second? I'll second that. Councillor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Matt? Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to thank John for this. This is an item that we've looked at for, well, three of the past four years uh, that I've been manager. I have a discussion annually with uh, with Joe Quitar of Moores and Cabot about this. Uh, John reached out watching the um, interest rates and where they were going and uh, jumped on the uh, jumped at the opportunity and and got this and he did a lot of hard work pulling together a lot of data and i just want to take a moment to thank him for his efforts on that because you know at this time of year we all acutely feel the the need for saving funds and uh trying to be sharp stewards for the town's resources and uh this is just a great example of that i wanted to thank him uh, publicly for that thank you thank you very much matt and thank you john uh any other discussion Seeing none, Deb, could you read the roll? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next up is item number 71-2020, short-term rental ordinance amendments. Um, before I open it up to the public for comment, I just wanna um, uh, make a brief statement that um, this is uh, the intended uh, action on this tonight is to refer it to a future council workshop. Um, we're happy to take any comment from the public. The ordinance committee has been working for um, uh, I think about eight, eight or nine months now um, uh, to come up with where we're at on this currently. Um, it's anticipated that there will be continued council workshop followed by public hearing, followed by, uh, I'm sorry, fo followed by planning board uh, meetings and public hearings, followed by town council public hearings. I lay all that out just to say that tonight's not by any means the only opportunity to speak on this. Um, and just to let people know where we are in the process. So uh, with that, I will open up for any public comment. If there's anybody that wishes to make any at this time, just please uh, raise your hand uh, in the meeting function. And I'm not seeing anybody interested to speak at the moment. So uh, with that, um, uh, again, just by way of an introduction and recap, um, the full council referred back in September a review of the short-term rental reg uh, regulations. Um, the ordinance committee has been working since that time, holding a number of meetings, uh, which have all been well attended by the public. And uh, we've received a tremendous amount of public input um, uh, uh, through email and other correspondence. Um, at the uh, April 16th meeting of the Ordinance Committee, um, we voted to recommend that the short-term rental revisions uh, be brought forward to the council. Um, and uh, the recommended action here is that the council set a June 1 workshop for further discussion and in-depth review. 
So is there any counselor that wishes to make that motion? Um, Penny, um, I will make that motion that we um, uh, send the recommended changes to a workshop of the full council um, on June 1st, 2020, so that we can work together as a team to uh, continue to craft these ordinances. Thank you, Penny. Uh, thank you for your work also leading the committee. Is there a second? I'll second that. Councillor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to refer the amendments to the Monday, June 1st, 2020 workshop of the town council. Deborah? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next up is item number 72-2020, consideration of a resolution supporting the Maine Equal Rights Amendment. Um, this is something that was brought forward to us by uh, Representative Ann Carney, who I see in the participants attendees uh, list. So um, Ann, if you would like to begin our public comment with an introduction of this, and then I'll ask for any other public comment. And your mic is open, go ahead. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Awesome. Um, I just wanna echo the comments that um, the town manager made earlier today about the tremendous work that all the town employees are doing and actually all the work that you're doing um, navigate unanticipated situation. Um, the town has really handled the COVID pandemic in an amazing way and um, I just applaud and acknowledge all of your hard work. Uh, I would like Thank to you. move on to, um, you're welcome. Um, I want to talk to you about the resolution that I've asked the town council to consider it is a resolution calling on the legislature to pass the Maine Equal Rights Amendment. And the next step uh, after the amendment passes, the equal, after the legislature passes the Equal Rights Amendment would be to put it out to the voters. We were hoping that that would take place this November in conjunction with the 2020 election. Um, this is a movement that started in light of the fact that Maine uh, neglected to amend its own constitution when Maine ratified the federal Equal Rights Amendment. And interest in it at this point in time was sparked by the fact that this is the 200th anniversary of statehood for Maine and also the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And it seemed like the ideal time for us to um, acknowledge equal rights rights regardless of sex and incorporate that into the main constitution. The reason that I'm asking the uh, town of Cape Elizabeth to pass the resolution is because we're working on a statewide basis to build momentum toward uh, adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment by the legislature and, and putting it forward to the voters. I just have to pause and acknowledge that that may not happen this year because it's unclear when and whether the legislature will reconvene, unfortunately. Um, but we are still moving forward with this important issue. It's important for uh, a lot of different reasons, actually. Um, I think a lot of you know that I'm a lawyer and there is a lot of legal significance to the main constitution, including an equal rights amendment. First of all, it elevates the justification for any law that distinguishes between uh, people based on sex to uh, require that the state show a compelling state interest. It also um, provides guidance to state and municipal officials in policy making matters when we enact laws and adopt ordinances. And then uh, finally, and I mentioned this earlier, it does help build the statewide momentum to adopting a constitutional amendment that will guarantee equality regardless of sex. And I'll just read the language that is the proposed amendment to the Maine Constitution. 
and it's a very uh, egalitarian phrasing of the amendment. It says equality of rights under the law may not be denied or abridged by the state or any political subdivision of the state based on the sex of an individual. The legislature has the power to enforce this section by appropriate legislation. And then a um, couple of other points that I wanted to make. Let's see. Um, I think I will just um, first pivot to some, in, some testimony before the committee. I did provide you with really important testimony by the bill sponsor, Representative Lois Reckett from South Portland. I also provided you with Governor Mills' testimony in support of the bill and Mary Bonato, who is a highly regarded lawyer who has achieved um, positive decisions by the United States Supreme Court supporting uh, sex equality. But what I want to end on, I think, is the uh, speech that Republican Senator Margaret Chase Smith gave in the United States Senate when she spoke in favor of the Federal Equal Rights Amendment. Because although it was many years ago, it still is really um, poignant and important to um, acknowledge her concerns at the time and it motivates me to work for passage of the Equal Rights Amendment in Maine. She said that, um, she, and I'm reading her words, but in being for this equal rights measure, I can appreciate some of the difficulties. These difficulties must be overcome. It may take time, but the more we delay, the harder it will ever be to achieve the objective. And I, she was talking to the speaking about the political difficulties of some people not wanting to support it. And, um, and we're facing that in Maine, and that's one reason why we're asking um, municipal governments throughout the state to express support, because there is some reluctance that we're trying to overcome. And then she said that she says, um, further down in her speech, I think the most effective argument, and she had given a couple of them, I think the most effective argument for weak, equal rights is summed up in three simple words. Women are people. Think that over, think that over just a little and you will see the justice and overwhelming merit of the equal rights measure. And then just to let you know as a council that there are quite a number of municipalities who have adopted this resolution and um, others are considering it, but the city of Portland passed it a couple of weeks ago. Bangor and Gray have passed it, I believe Harpswell, and I don't, but I don't have a complete list of the, the um, municipalities. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, and I would urge you to add Cape Elizabeth's voice to the municipalities throughout the state that are speaking up for adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, are there, uh, we'll start with questions. Uh, we'll return to public comment uh, momentarily, but uh, Council Jordan, go ahead, Penny Jordan. Yes, and um, I'm sure there was a lot of discussion around this and, and um, we've come a long way since the um, uh, federal um, passage of um, equal rights. Um, was there much discussion around addressing gender versus sex? Because I, I think that over the years, we've developed more of a, um, a kind of a narrative around gender and gender choices and things such as that. Because when I think about uh, equality today today i think it's equality based on somebody's um uh, identity how they identify from a gender perspective yeah that that was something that was discussed and i don't know if you had an opportunity to read through mary bonato's testimony but that is a motivating factor for this. And it's not that we didn't um, 
switch the language to the word gender. We kept the, the language of sex because that's consistent with the efforts to get a federal equal rights amendment passed and with the work that has been, this body of work that's been going on since the, the 1970s with regard to constitutional amendments. Uh -huh. but, the, but the language and the way this particular amendment to Maine's constitution is phrased would address the issue of, of stereotyping people based on sex. And um, I think that Mary Bonato's description of the impact of this amendment was really uh, powerful. She said, uh, in, in addition to protecting men and women vis-a-vis -vis each other as classes or as individuals, the common understanding of sex includes sex stereotyping and stereotypes are predicated on gender roles about how all men or all women, sh women should behave and present themselves. And so this amendment would incorporate um, and this is her testimony, incorporate gender identity and sexual orientation classifications, which are now commonly understood to be discriminatory based on sex, both literally and by operation of sex stereotyping. So it would cover that as well, Councillor Jordan. I would, um, sometime you and I might have to have coffee over that because I think that that is true if you have a, a, a liberal, um, um, Supreme Court, I don't think it's true if you have a conservative Supreme Court. I think sex will be defined very narrowly, but that's, that's another whole subject. I understand the intent of what's trying to be accomplished here and that it needs to align with uh, uh, what is in the federal uh, language, but I don't think it will achieve uh, equality for um, for people who may be outside of uh, traditional um, definitions around sex. Yeah, I understand and appreciate your concerns. And um, I do think that if we were starting this um, legal, this, um, we're kind of hopefully toward the end of the work that we're doing on gender equality. And had we, if we were at the beginning, we probably would use different language. Um, I, I would just reassure you that, um, you know, this is an amendment to the main constitution and the main case law on um, sex being inclusive of um, prohibitions against gender stereotyping and the protections for gender expression are, are stronger in Maine. And I do think that this amendment to the Maine Constitution would provide a strong foundation for the statutes that do accomplish that. And I appreciate your concern. Thanks for expressing it. There are other questions, uh, Councilor Straw? Uh, yep, uh, so uh, thank you, Anne, for bringing this forward. Uh, I support the, the resolve. My issue is with looking at the whereas clauses. I don't agree with the third, the fourth, and the sixth whereas clauses. Um, uh, in, I'm curious, uh, striking those, would you have a problem with us striking those three whereases? Um, just because I think the third one is clearly wrong. The right to vote remains women's only constitutionally protected right. Everyone has the right to a fair trial, yada, 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 yada. So as written, I don't, I don't think that's accurate. Um, and then the fourth one, uh, all other rights, um, I again have the position that people inherently have rights in the constitution irrespective of sex. So as written, the fourth one, I also kind of don't mm -hmm. fully agree with. And then the no language in the constitution prohibiting discrimination on sex. I have a broad view of the uh, equal rights amendments uh, as drafted that I think they already prohibit it. I realize not everyone shares that view. So I, I get I get the point of why we need the, the, the amendment, but because of the fact that I already think, and I recognize that uh, case law may be different and other people have different views, but because I already think it is already discriminate, uh, it are, is already prohibited in my opinion. That's why I also don't like that. Whereas, because we're saying, oh, you can do it right now. And I'm like, no, you can't. So for that, that reason, um, 
though those whereas is I, I don't agree with and I would support passing it without those whereas is I'm curious if you have any comments on that yeah thanks for raising that I see where you're coming from I think that I don't uh, read the language quite as closely as you do as far as um, kind of narrowly interpreting it I think that that those whereas is are intended to set a framework. Uh, I would also let you know that um, from the perspective of building statewide momentum toward passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, we try to reach a format for the resolution that um, municipalities across the state would all consider and vote on. And so, as part of that momentum building process, the my preference would be to not strike out the whereas is. I think that the legally effective part of the resolution is the resolution itself rather than the resolves. And um, so that would be that would be my comments. I appreciate where you're coming from. I think that the whereas is are are more about general language setting a framework good point. Um, good point um are there any other questions specifically for representative carney is there anybody from the public that wishes to make any comment on this particular item seeing nobody um is there any Sorry, is there anybody from the council that would like to make a motion? Council Devereaux, uh, you're on mute. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that, Go ahead. that the council um, consider this resolution or resolve, consider re supporting this resolve for the main equal rights amendment. Motion from Councillor Devereaux to support the resolution presented. Is there a second? Second. Councillor Straw seconds. Any discussion? Uh, did we need public comment? I asked for it and there was none. Ah, Thanks, Del. Mind, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, and just one quick question for me, which is um, uh, you, you mentioned the other number of towns and communities. What, what are you up to so far? I, I'm not sure if I caught that when I was managing, looking for raised hands. Yeah, thank you. Um, yep. I don't know exactly. I asked the bill sponsor, uh, Lois Reckett, Representative Reckett, and she identified for me some communities and then I started doing a municipality by municipality search and quickly found that that was kind of uh, cumbersome. And so I don't have a number for you. I and I I would say it's probably fewer than 20, if I, um, my understanding. Um, it does include the two uh, largest cities in Maine, Portland and Bangor, um, and then a number of other smaller communities as well. Great, thanks. Uh, any other discussion? Go ahead. Penny? My raise, my hand is raised, I think. I'll lower it now. And I, I just have to, um, I'm sorry, this is probably going to come across a, a little wrong. Um, I see this as a gesture and not a need. I don't, I don't see that there's an, an issue in the, in the state of Maine that requires this around um, a constitutional change. And I'll go to some of the points Chris made because if you look at the whereas is, um, 
I see that it's not a problem, but what we're trying to do is make a gesture as a result of it being a bicentennial and um, the suffragette movement and, and all of that. And so that's what I see this as. And uh, I, I have difficulty um, having lived through the 70s um, uh, and uh, women's rights at that point in time, doing something that is a gesture and not a need. Anne, did you want to respond to that at all? Or? Yeah, I would like to, um, because I, I um, respectfully would like to present and um, to disagree with you, Councillor Jordan, because what we're seeing now on a federal level is an erosion of some civil rights, including especially civil rights related to sex discrimination and against women and also um, equality for people regardless of sex. And I'm thinking in particular about the Affordable Care Act and the really important protections that were layered onto the Affordable Care Act um, in the rulemaking process that created both um, equality for people's access to medical care regardless of gender identity or expression and also created mechanisms for individuals to uh, basically seek remedies for violations and all of that rulemaking has um, been attacked uh, recently and is is being reversed and people are losing rights based on things that are happening at an administrative level. And that could percolate up to people losing rights at things that are happening either at a state or federal legislative level. And it is uh, to change a law only requires 50% plus one, whereas to um, change the constitution to revoke a guarantee of equality would take two thirds of a vote. And I, and I do think that it still is meaningful given um, you know, what could happen in our country and also what I've seen happen with regard to the um, medical protections under the Affordable Cares Act that were created through the regulatory process. And I, um, and I do think that having a value stated clearly in our constitution, our state constitution that can't be um, revoked unless two thirds of the state agree. I think that that's, um, that's very valuable and provides uh, security to uh, advancing equality in all of our policies in Maine. Any other council discussion? I do. Can you, Go ahead. Am I unmuted? Um, yep. I, I also think this is very important. I think that um, we're sending a message that as Cape Elizabeth, we believe that this is um, important to create an amendment that um, establishes uh, these rights based on, um, that we can't discriminate based on sex. I think it's really important that we send that message. It's not, um, we're not changing the law, we're just sending a message. And I think that um, Cape Elizabeth needs to do that. So I'm in agreement with Anne and I'm gonna vote for this. Any other discussion? Seeing none, uh, Deb, could you read the roll? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? No. 
Councillor Penelope Jordan? No. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries four yay, two nay. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again, Ann, for bringing this forward. The next item on the agenda is item number 73-2020, fiscal year 21, uh, scheduling of a public hearing. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting in the finance report, uh, we'll go through uh, just so everybody's super clear on the upcoming um, budget dates and things like that uh, as it relates to the um, municipal budget. Um, so uh, we've already uh, at our last um, special meeting voted to set to May 27th, which is a Wednesday evening, the Wednesday following um, Memorial Day, a special meeting at which we will vote on the municipal budget. The motion here is to set to a public hearing for next Monday evening, May 18th, um, a chance for the public to uh, offer uh, testimony and comment on the proposed fiscal 21 municipal budget. Um, there will be subsequent uh, public hearings and votes on the school budget. Um, we have not completely locked those in at this time, given the continued uncertainty around uh, decision on referendum votes uh, and whether or not they will take place this year, um, given the COVID emergency. Um, the current statewide election is set for Tuesday, July 14th. If we were to um, uh, be operating under our normal procedures, um, the council would vote on Monday, June 15th uh, on, the fisc on the fiscal 21 school budget number uh, to put forward to the referendum vote. Um, so um, if, if, the, if the state changes uh, its it stance on whether or not to actually hold um, a referendum vote, we, we may look at adjusting that date or, or have some flexibility there, but if not, it's likely that on Monday, the 15th of June is when the school budget would be voted on. Uh, we would also then likely hold a, in, in either case, a public hearing on that budget the prior Monday. Uh, so what's that, the 8th, June 8th, um, uh, which we will likely formally set that at our special meeting on May 27th. So that's the school budget. Back to this item of the uh, municipal budget. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this particular item at the moment? Seeing nobody. Um, if there are no questions uh, from the council, I'll entertain a motion uh, to set the fiscal 21 Cape Elizabeth municipal budget to a public hearing on Monday, May 18th, uh, which will be either at the town hall or via Zoom meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. So motion moved. by Councilor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Second that. Councilor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, so I just have a question. It, um, you mentioned that the state may um, update its guidance on referenda for school budgets. Is the anticipation at this time that the guidance from the state would allow municipalities to opt out of a referenda or just cancel them altogether? I, I guess the question is, could we, are we anticipating a situation where the town could still opt to hold that referendum, even if the state has said we don't have to? I'll let both Matt and Deb weigh in, but I don't think it's going to be a matter of choice. I think it has more to do with, you know, maximum capacity of gathering places where polling would take place, et cetera. But um, Matt or Deb, if you want to uh, expand on that, go ahead. Sure, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that, uh, that's been the primary concern voiced by a number of different towns. Uh, 
and, and it's to try to be in compliance with the governor's order while at the same time uh, being able to be in compliance with the town's charters, uh, which is quite a balancing act if you think about towns across the state. Cape Elizabeth has, has the ability to approve uh, the budget as, at the council level with voter ratification at the, uh, or, uh, at the, at the polls. Uh, other towns, such as uh, RSU towns or SAD towns, they have to have a district meeting before they then send it out to referendum. So if, it, if you have a multi-town district, they usually have it, and I used to joke, because uh, I live in an SAU town in, uh, in Gray, uh, we used to joke that they had it on the hottest, hottest day and, and in the smallest room. Uh, obviously, neither of those approaches is going to work this year, so a number of towns across the state are pushing the governor to say, you know, would you consider this one year allowing the elected officials in each community to have that approval? Uh, Debbie and I were on a, uh, well, we had our department heads uh, meeting this morning, uh, and Donna Wolfram was also uh, participating, and we've heard nothing. Uh, I, so I know it's been raised a lot. Uh, obviously, we're getting really close to the time where we need to have a decision on this and guidance. Uh, you know, we're ordering ballots this week, and uh, it's frustrating, I guess, the bottom line is. But that's that's kind of what we're, we're waiting to see. And I thought we were going to get some guidance last week. We did not receive that. Uh, but the big challenge is just going to be putting through the volume of voters. Obviously, it's going to be a big push to have absentee as the primary objective uh, or primary way of voting this year uh, for a lot of folks for safety reasons. But at the same time, uh, I know the governor has expressed at least from what I understand some uh, apprehension to, to going this route uh, because she likes to have people be able to participate in the democratic pro processes so it's a darned if you do darned if you don't type of situation uh, you're trying to protect the folks uh, safety and well health and welfare while at the same time you don't want to uh, you don't want to take away their right to freedom uh, to, uh, or their rights to vote so uh, stand by for future updates Uh, other discussion? Go so ahead, Matt. I, I had one other question. Uh, Debbie and I were just talking about it logistically. Uh, we wanted to see what the council's desire was for the public hearing next week and then for the meeting on the 27th as far as uh, time of day, if you wanted to go for 6 p.m. or if 7 p.m. would work better. Uh, we're good either way, obviously, but uh, as we need to uh, post uh, the dates and times for these meetings, uh, we just wanted to see what the council's preference was on that. Okay. Um, re related to that, you know, the, the draft motion said either at the town hall or via Zoom. Uh, the, the recommendation is going to be for Zoom because uh, okay. uh, we're still within phase one of the governor's plan. So I, I think uh, folks should plan on being comfortable for a while uh, based on <laughs> based on our direction so far. I would anticipate probably through July and then hopefully going towards August for, for live meetings again, September at the latest. Okay. Um, Deb, we, uh, have we, has there already been a motion made? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep, we have a motion and a second. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention, Matt and I talked about earlier as well, is um, the state law regarding the school uh, validation vote does not require a public hearing for the school budget. The, the council could certainly set one you know, a week before their uh, June 15th vote. You may also want to consider um, a public hearing on Monday, uh, this coming Monday with the municipal and all the special funds budgets. If anybody has any uh, comments on any of the budgets as everything's a part and parcel together. So that would be up to you folks as well. But um, you certainly can do a separate uh, school uh, public hearing at another time, but you're not required to uh, by the state law under the uh, school validation law. Um, I'll weigh in. My personal preference would be to have uh, a specific public hearing for the school budget, um, uh, uh, depending on the will of the council next week. Um, happy to to broaden um, any input that we get from folks um, should it sort of 
bridge both financial uh, budgets and topics. Um, but I think it's important to have a, a specific um, public hearing on the budget, all the more so if we are in a position where we're not putting it out to referendum. Uh, I think that actually makes it more important to have a public hearing than, than if it was going to the voters to decide. So um, that's my two cents. Uh, as far as um, time, I'm completely indifferent. Um, so if anybody, if there's a prevailing preference for next Monday, um, uh, it, I think we're probably likely to get a little bit more participation at seven o'clock just because it's a little, little past the dinner hour. Um, so I guess, I guess my, my lean would be towards seven unless there was a compelling reason not to. I don't think we'll have as many people. I, I expect there to be turnout. I don't think there'll be as many people for the municipal budget as there will for the school budget. So I'm not worried about it running long into the evening. Happy to hear what others think. I this is Penny. I prefer seven because my work day goes till six, so I prefer seven o'clock. All right, I'm seeing head nods, so why don't we keep it for seven o'clock? So there's a motion on the table to set the municipal budget public hearing to Monday, May 18th at seven o'clock. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, could we call the roll, please? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next up is item number 74-2020, uh, scheduling a working session with the Energy Committee. Um, the Energy Committee, as most of us know, has been um, at work on RFP uh, for solar project and is looking to discuss uh, the request for proposals uh, uh, for that project with the Council. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak about this item? Seeing none, is there a motion from the Council on this item? Council Gaberson? Um, I move that we set a public hearing with the Energy Committee for June 1st as the cat walks across my piano. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I, I second think that. A, I think you meant a <laughs> workshop for that. Uh, so um, motion by Councilor Gabrielson to set a workshop for the first, seconded by Penny Jordan. Is mm -hmm. there any discussion? Seeing none, Deb, can you read the roll again? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next item is a, uh, involves a motion to move into executive session. Um, I in the interest of logistics and time, um, while I recognize that we will technically need to come back into public session following the executive session, I just wonder if it makes the most sense to take any last citizen comment for items not on the agenda at this point, because um, otherwise I think we'll have difficulty reconvening everybody. So, um, seeing no objection to that, I will ask if there's anybody from the public that wishes to speak to anything that was not on tonight's agenda that's still with us. If you could raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, on item number 75-2020, annual evaluation of the town manager, is there a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to one MRS Statute 4056A to continue the annual evaluation of the manager. So moved. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Devereaux. Any discussion? Mr. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yep. 
If I may, I just want to let you know, uh, and the council should have received an invite uh, for the exec, exec session uh, about about 6.30, I think is when it got scheduled. So uh, what I'll do at the end of this is I'll close this down. And uh, if you'd be so kind afterwards to just let uh, Deborah know at what time that uh, you leave executive session. So do we actually have to return to? I, I think you'll be fine in this, in okay. this case because you took care of the uh, additional opportunity for public comment and that's all that would remain at the end of the, uh, okay. end of the evening. Great. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, Deb, could you read the roll on the motion to move into executive session? Deb, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Councilor no Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. All right. So we will disconnect this link and join up in another minute on the other one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, John. Thank Thanks.